Tonight, crying for the cameras. Why I'm a skeptic about Alberta's energy minister's public meltdown. It's December 11th. You're watching The Ezra Levant Show. Why should others go to jail Why? when you're a biggest carbon yeah. consumer I know? There's 8,500 customers here, and you won't give them an answer. You come here once a year with a sign, and you feel morally superior. The only thing I have to say to the government for why I publish it is because it's my bloody right to do so. Just a disgrace out of Alberta, an utter embarrassment. The energy minister, Margaret McQuaig Boyd, who is from a rural riding, she was forced, along with the other rural NDP MLAs, to vote against her own constituents and approve the farm unionization law called Bill 6. That's not quite right, of course. She could have stood with her constituents and voted against the bill. I mean, what would the NDP have done? Kicked her out of cabinet? That would have made her a hero. But no, McQuaig Boyd chose loyalty to the NDP and loyalty to the unions over loyalty to her own neighbors. Pitiful. A disgrace, a betrayal, a betrayal. But get this, when she stood up, the great betrayer, she started to cry. And I get it, it was very emotional. She had made a terrible moral decision to vote against her friends and neighbors and to choose her NDP party over Albertans. I get it. It was the tears of cowardice, the cry of a sellout. But she said it was something else. She said she had been, get this, cyberbullied, a 63-year-old woman. She said she had been threatened by people. She wouldn't say who, but she had been threatened. She was afraid. That's why she was crying as she stood up to betray her neighbors. Here, watch this display. We have received many calls, um, some in support, some in not, but a climate has been created where, thank you, um, where people are afraid, afraid to speak. Uh, I myself was somewhat concerned to go home last week. Um, I do know now what it's like to be cyberbullied. I do know what it's like to have threats. <laughs> but I do want to speak about the concerns of moving forward. Really, people are afraid to speak? Who's afraid to speak? She's not, obviously. What's she talking about? And she says she was, quote, somewhat concerned to go home? I like that somewhat part. What does that mean? She said she was cyberbullied and had, quote, threats? Okay, well, then I shouldn't be mean to her. I mean, if someone has threats to her, especially a, a woman, I, I can understand why she's crying, except that I wrote to her yesterday and asked why she hasn't reported the matter to police yet. Isn't that what you do when you have a threat? I've had threats. Most of the time, they're not serious. I don't take insults as threats. There's a difference. But once in a blue moon, if I get a real threat enough to make me want to cry, I call the cops. So why hasn't she done that? If it's cyberbullying, then where is the email or text message or Facebook message? Why not show it to police to prove it? Why would she talk about it before the perpetrator is apprehended? Why wouldn't she show all of us? But hang on, which was it? Was it a phone call or a cyber thing? Well, no answer from her office after a full day. If I get an answer, I'll let you know. Now, there's a temptation in politics, as in real life, to stand back when someone is crying and to take them at face value, especially a grown woman. If a grown woman is crying and makes, says that there was a threat to her or a somewhat threat, and the very first thing she talks about, well, get that person to a women's shelter, get her out of her dangerous situation. Isn't that what you do in real life to a woman who's crying? But in real life, someone who is threatened doesn't go into a big room called the legislature with cameras on and put on a show with a box of Kleenex handy as a prop. In real life, if you were threatened, you go to the police or to a shelter. You don't go to the TV cameras. Now, I've said before that McQuaig Boyd seems like a sweet woman, totally out of her element. I mean, did you know she wasn't even consulted on the carbon tax before it was publicly announced by Premier Nolly? Isn't that amazing? For six months, no one in the industry has taken her seriously as energy minister. She's got nothing to do with the oil and gas industry. Now her own government doesn't even pretend to take her seriously as energy minister. So she's like a deer in the headlights. So I'm tempted to believe her. She's just a naive woman out of her element. Despite the weirdness of rushing to the TV cameras instead of the police, despite the vagueness and the contradictions in her story. But you know what? I don't believe her. 
because she's not the first NDP MLA to claim a threat of violence. She's the fourth one. And the first three have all later admitted they were lying, and all three of them have apologized. The first liar to falsely claim threats against him was an NDP MLA named Shay Anderson. He publicly stated that a crowd of farmers protesting Bill 6 at the legislature was violent. Here, one of our MLAs got screamed at and it was extremely violent and brutal. That's what he wrote. Really? So screaming, violent, sorry, extremely violent and brutal, eh? Except Anderson wasn't even there. Our cameras were there, as were other media. There was no violence at all. There was nothing brutal. No one was screaming. It was actually a family event. Kids. Even someone brought a funny turkey. Shay Anderson, the NDP MLA, just outright lied. He slurred the farmers as violent. He lied. He wasn't even there. He's the boy who cried wolf. He later apologized after his smear had made the rounds online. Next came this liar, an NDP MLA named Cam Westhead. He lied too, though a little more subtly. He wrote a Facebook post implying that a Wild Rose MLA and farmer named Rick Strankman was threatening some sort of gun violence if Bill 6 went through. Another lie. What Strankman was pointing out was that firearms are illegal on work sites insured by the Workers' Compensation Board, but every farm in Alberta has a shotgun or a rifle, which are tools on a farm for obvious reasons, like warding off predators that would come for the animals. But there's not a single farmer or rancher in the, ML, in the NDP government, so they have no idea that there's firearms on farms, and for a good reason. Or maybe they have an idea, but Cam Westhead wanted to portray Strankman as violent anyway. So he did. So Westhead smeared Strankman online, implying he was threatening violence. And West had later apologized after the damage was done. Do you see a pattern here? And then came the third of the NDP liars, Brian Mason, cabinet minister. Listen what he called the Wild Rose Party and its farmer supporters in the legislature itself. Take a listen. These goons over here are... I'm on that. And you can't hear it there, but he, he took it a step further. On the official record from the legislature, he also called them gangsters. Really? Goons? Gangsters? Well, if you've been watching our network lately, you have seen literally a half a dozen town hall meetings, prairie protests, public meetings, things like that. And you've seen the most orderly, friendly, family-oriented, polite protest in the history of Alberta. I mean, seriously, have you ever seen cowboys and farmers protest before in your life? Have you ever seen a Hutterite farmer protest before? These people couldn't be more gentle, more civilized. And yet three NDP MLAs lied about them in a row, called them violent, said they screamed, said they were brutal, said they were threatening firearms violence. They said they were goons and gangsters, yet every word was a lie. And now this. We have received many calls, um, some in support, some in not, but a climate has been created where, thank you, um, where people are afraid, afraid to speak. Uh, I myself was somewhat concerned to go home last week. Um, I do know now what it's like to be cyberbullied. I do know what it's like to have threats. <laughs> but I do want to speak about the concerns of moving forward. I'm sorry. McQuaig Boyd's story on its own is pretty iffy. Like I say, real people who are really threatened go to the cops, not to TV cameras. I might have given her the benefit of the doubt if the official NDP playbook hadn't been rolled out three times in advance with exactly the same vague, incredible smears of violence. This is about a rural MLA, Margaret McQuaig Boyd, betraying her neighbors, getting an earful, and yeah, maybe even some insults. Lord knows she deserves them. And then trying to flip the blame on her neighbors, blaming them. It's 2015. If you're a cabinet minister, 
and you're taking heat for betraying your friends and neighbors, you take the heat. You don't break down and cry. Not if the very next day you talk about strong women and women leading the province and how women can do anything men can do. You don't play the feminist card one day and then the damsel in distress the next day. You can't play the high-level executive running Alberta's most important energy ministry one day, negotiating with billion-dollar companies, making billion-dollar decisions, and then the next day have a good cry on TV when things get tough. The NDP are the ones who have been brutal who are making threats, not threats of violence, but threats of destroying 150 years of farming and ranching in Alberta with no consultation, forcing closure of the debate, ignoring good faith concerns. If this kind of economic destruction were being wreaked on, say, a labor union, you really would have violent threats. That's their stock in trade. It's a disgrace for Shea Anderson, Cam Westhead, and Brian Mason to project their own violent union tactics onto peaceful farmers. And it's utterly humiliating that a 63-year-old cabinet minister, Margaret McQuaig Boyd, thinks that crying is the best way to stop people from criticizing her for her disloyalty. Sorry, I'm not buying the tears. In my view, she's a liar and a disgrace. Stay with us for more. Welcome back. Hey, Justin Trudeau is the new prime minister, as you know. And the day after he was sworn in as prime minister, he cleared his agenda of everything less important to make time for a glamour shoot with America's Vogue magazine with him looking dreamy, looking out into space, having deep thoughts. And then him sitting with his legs splayed wide open, hugging his wife with his legs in a rather intimate picture, better put on a, I don't know, a private wall in his own bedroom. But no, this is the image that Canada's new prime minister wishes to, wishes to project in the age of Putin, the age of the Islamic State. This was the most important, most urgent thing. Joining us now from New York City to talk about this is our friend and contributor, Gavin McKinnis. Gavin, I mean, the media are loving it. I mean, the Canadian media are so thrilled that Vogue had, has noticed our male model prime minister. The official people think this is wonderful. Am I alone to say, get a room, and when you're done doing your private stuff in the room, come out and be a public prime minister? Yeah, it's pretty embarrassing. And as a Canadian, I'm thoroughly embarrassed. But this is what happens when you elect a Zoolander prime minister. Canada, mostly women and young people, by the way, voted for a Zoolander prime minister, a male model. And what does he do? He male models. This is exactly what you asked for. And the thing that is so frustrating is no one else finds it embarrassing. The worse he gets, the more people go, oh, isn't he a gift from God? Yeah. You know, it, we've been used to this kind of tongue baths from the stenography uh, of, of the, I call it the media party because they don't even pretend anymore. We, I mean, that's what helped win it for him. But now the New York Times and Vogue, he's checking all the boxes that a, a wannabe Kardashian would check, a wannabe Bieber would check. And our intellectual class loves it. I mean, here's a guy uh, dropped out, a, uh, you know, he was taking an environmental degree in college, dropped out was being a substitute drama teacher, dropped out, went backpacking. I mean, he is, he's a ne'er-do-well, never written a book, never started a company, never ran a business, never, never served in any way. This is really his first job. 100% of it is based on his last name, his inherited money, and how handsome he is. And all the, the entire establishment class is gaga for him. I don't even get it. Who's watching The Watchmen? Is, is this what, are we so postmodern now? that all that matters is how you look on Instagram and Twitter. Is that all that matters? Yeah, well, look at who's voting. It used to be dads who ran elections. Landowners, taxpayers would elect presidents and prime ministers. Then everyone else got involved. The dads stopped voting. And in America, we have a cool president 
who plays basketball and smokes and acts like the Fonz and plays golf all the time and dances cool because he's a hunk. And in Canada, we have, again, a hunk. He's a himbo. We had Trudeau mania in the 70s and 80s, right? And Trudeau became so powerful and popular that he married a bimbo, a very attractive, stupid woman. And then she gave birth to kids that were 50% stupid. And now we have Trudeau's himbo, his bimbo wife, as our prime minister. And the scary part is, with this nanny looking after these two kids, she is raising more prime ministers. This is, not, this is only the beginning. This is a dynasty coming of himbo, moron, hunk, Prime Ministers. <laughs> you know what? Uh, if we were, I mean, Francis Fukuyama, I don't know, about 25 years ago now, wrote an essay called The End of History. Basically, the fall of the Berlin Wall, the whole world will embrace McDonald's and Disney. History's over. We're done. Now just perpetual peace. Yeah, not really. I mean, Russia is revanchist under Vladimir Putin. The Islamic State uh, and other terrorist groups are on the march, physically on the march through Europe and now into North America. I think if we were in a land beyond history, then we could all just uh, amuse ourselves to death with, you know, the Kardashians and the Trudeaus. But actually, history is coming back with a vengeance. And in, we have actually are, are returning to medieval style brutality. You know, the Islamic State really is a state with 10 million people under it right now. I, I, I am worried that we are telegraphing to the world's countries, to our enemies, that we are weak and unserious, and to our friends, that we are weak and unserious. Thank God we've got three oceans around Canada, or we'd be trampled like any European microstate too. Well, we are weak, and you're right. We could have a himbo prime minister if our borders were closed and we had a sense of nationalism. We weren't ethno-masochists. But the elephant in the room with all this beta male tomfoolery is obviously Islam. When you lack bravado, when you lack courage, when you're not a patriot, you create a vacuum. And a bigger bully just moves in and says, fine, you want to be a wimp? I'll take over. And so while Trudeau dances around on fashion magazines and poses with his wife in ludicrous ways, Islam is saying, oh, good, here's a weak point here. We'll move in. I mean, we, just after this shooting here in San Bernardino, the first reaction from the majority of Americans seemed to be, let's not hurt anyone's feelings now. That's Trudeau in a nutshell. He's all about feelings. He's all about emotion. And he's not about the cold hard truth, which is we are at war right now. You know, what's funny is his... Uh, obsessive uh, insistence that we bring in 35,000 unvetted Syrians by the end of February. And when I say unvetted, I mean that. Our Brian Lilly uh, went to a technical briefing with Immigration Canada a couple days ago, and they told him, he asked, how many of these refugees applicants have been rejected? And they said, zero. So, I mean, you hire someone to be a babysitter, you hire someone to be a janitor, you're going to reject some applicants. Not one single person from this terrorist hellhole has been rejected. And here's what's so crazy, this postmodern metrosexual himbo, as you're saying, is bringing in tens of thousands of people from the most sexist, most misogynist, most homophobic, most violent part of the world in the name of tolerance and being cool. So he's photographed handing out, you know, uh, warm blankets to the kids as they arrive here in, in Toronto. But these people do not believe in, in a postmodern life. They believe in Islamic fascism. It's, it's, it's bringing its own destruction, and it's going to take the rest of us with it. Am I being too pessimistic? No, of course not. And how do you vet these people, by the way? Look at all the homegrown radicals. Most of them grew up as normal kids. As I was saying uh, on my Rebel video recently, the four London bombers, they grew up playing soccer, being wonderful little kids. They became radicalized and traveled back and forth to these Muslim countries. The Sarnev brothers, perfectly normal kids, they became radicalized after they were here. So even if you could do a magical CAT scan where you can see into these people's brain, that's no guarantee that they get seduced by Islam later in life. I don't know why we're taking any refugees at all, but say we do have to take some, why aren't they Christian? Why are we going with a religion that we've been at war with for many years and that seems to have totally different priorities than us? I mean, you ask the average Muslim, 
what his priorities are with, with ethnicity and his country and his religion. And the religion is always at the top. In North America, we don't work like that. And by the way, we see death as a bad thing. When our soldiers die, we mourn. When their soldiers die, they cheer. And it's the most bizarre enemy we've had in hundreds of years. And Trudeau's first reaction is, well, let's bring them in in droves and spend a fortune trying to assimilate the unassimilatable. Yeah. Well, he's not even trying to assimilate them. There is no screening whatsoever along culture or ideology. Every single woman I've seen coming off a plane is wearing a hijab. There are no liberals here. They wouldn't dare to ask, do you believe in the separation of mosque and state? Do you believe in the equality of men and women? How do you feel about Jews and gays? You know, they wouldn't dare ask those because they wouldn't get anyone on the plane and he's got to get his 500 a day quota. I mean, I believe in taking some refugees, but that means taking the lambs, not the wolves, taking some Yazidis, taking some Christian Arabs, taking some Kurds. I have no idea. This would be like in the 1940s, taking refugees who were ethnic German. Yeah, maybe there are some ethnic Germans who are against Nazism, but wouldn't you start by taking the Jews? Wouldn't you start here by taking the Yazidis or the Christians or the Kurds? Why are you taking some of the world's 1.2 billion Muslims? Why, why don't they stay in the Muslim country of Turkey or go to the Gulf states? I, I find this is a, is a Western suicide gene. I don't understand. Last word to you, Gavin, before I get myself too upset. Okay, Trudeau is a fop. He is royalty, and he's acting like, just picture him with sort of a big white wig and knee-high socks and a handkerchief. He is choosing Islam because it's dangerous and bold. It's like a, an ascot that clashes with your pocket square. It's an ostentatious political move, and that's why he's doing it. Ramifications are totally irrelevant to him. He's just doing what is the most fashionably bold move to do, and that's what you get when you have a royal fop for a prime minister. Yeah. Congratulations, ladies. Look who you elected. Yeah. You know, uh, I, I just learned a phrase last week called virtue signaling signaling to the world how virtuous you are. It's basically what the Paris Climate Conference was all about. I'll cut uh, CO2 by this much. No, I'll go this much. So I'll, I mean, no one means it. No one's actually going to stop uh, using jets, but they're signaling how virtuous they are by how far their goal. The, the difference between the Paris Climate Conference is no one actually means it, but when you do your virtue signaling by saying, you'll take 10,000 refugees, I'll take, take 20,000, I'll take 50,000, you actually mean it, and you actually bring the war into the bosom of your own country. Gavin, it's great to talk to you. Hey, everybody, that's Gavin McKinnis. Check out his vids all over our website. Good to see you, my friend. Cheers. Hey, folks, stay tuned. More after these words. Looking for the perfect gift? Did you know the Rebel.media has a store? Make a statement with a t-shirt. Have your morning coffee in a Fearless Travel coffee mug. There's even an Ezra LeVant bobblehead. It's a one-stop shop for the perfect gift. And don't forget to pick up something for yourself. Go to therebel.media slash store to find out more. Welcome back. Well, if you're with the Royal Canadian Air Force, there's a bit of a switcheroo in your strategic priorities. Used to be we had six CF-18 jets pounding Islamic State terrorists in Iraq and Syria, but now that mission is being ended in favor of a new mission. Our RCAF will basically be bus drivers bringing Syrian refugees to Canada. No more war fighting, just a lot of immigration duties. Joining us now to talk about that is John Thompson, who for 25 years was with the McKenzie Institute and is now a security analyst. Great to see you. Thank you. I'm, I'm worried about this for two reasons. First of all, or three reasons. As the rest of the Western alliance realizes that the Islamic State is a serious security threat, a terrorism threat, the UK, France, Germany, the United States all ramping up their efforts, Russia too, we're abandoning them. That's reason one. Reason two, we're bringing in tens of thousands of refugees of all sorts in a time span that we could only process a fraction of it with proper security screening. And finally, who are we bringing? It doesn't appear to me that we're bringing the lambs, we're bringing the wolves. We're not bringing, you know, the victims, the Christian Arabs, the Yazidis. We're bringing uh, Muslims of the more fundamentalist variety, just judging by the hijabs they're wearing. This is what worries me. Are my worries uh, well put, or am I just being a worry wart? No, your, your worries are extremely well put. 
Uh, and there's, there's a whole series of problems. But the big thing is our new government has just signaled that they have not lost the soft power delusions of the 1990s. And this idea that somehow or other Canada, by you know, sprinkling sunshine and flowers and bringing out the dancing girls, can be a moral force in the world, when the lesson of the last 15 years is that kinetics are required. Well, it's funny because Jason Kenney, the former conservative defense minister, I, I saw he made a statement yesterday on Twitter that the liberals have abandoned Paul Martin's fuzzy concept of the responsibility to protect. I don't really believe in that philosophy. I don't think Canada has a responsibility outside of our own borders. But if you are a humanitarian, which the liberals claim to be, wouldn't you help save victims of the Islamic State? So Kenny is saying not, they're not even into soft power. They're into no power. I mean, isn't part of soft power helping victims instead of just saying, yeah, we'll take a few thousand of the millions who are being displaced? Or, or trying to end the conflict so people can stay home. If you'll remember, even under Chrétien, we went into Afghanistan in 2002 and committed to it, primarily so that Afghanistan would not only be rid of al-Qaeda as a terrorist training base, but also so that the country would finally stabilize and in a million and a half refugees could return home, which most of them did. Instead, we're doing nothing about ending the conflict uh, and <clears throat> actually probably contributing to it by giving an out for people who should surrender, but instead they can get their, their families to a safe place. And no doubt we'll see their men later. Huh. Well, and that's the thing, because in Syria, there are a multitude of different militias, terrorist groups, just plain old gangs with guns. And it's not just the Islamic State. There's Al-Qaeda, there's Hezbollah. There's, there, there's the, the Syrian Free Army, the Syrian Arab Army. There's so many different forces. And who's to know who we're bringing in? Brian Lilly uh, went to a technical briefing in the immigration ministry and was told that not a single refugee applicant has been rejected. Not one has been rejected. How do you do that when there's more enemies out there than ever before? The proportion of people we want to keep out is higher than ever before, and yet they have a 100% acceptance rate. Yeah, it's one of the most stupid things the Canadian government has probably ever done. Uh, I can't think of a policy error as, as grievous as this one. But I mean, I mean, we had the Ugandan, when, when Idi Amin in Uganda said he was going to kill all the Ismaili Muslims about 40 years ago. We opened our gates to them, but those are the most liberal, gentle Muslims in the world, the Ismailis, they follow the Aga Khan. Those were not terrorists themselves. When we opened our, our doors to Vietnamese refugees, there were some crime issues and other issues, but there wasn't a terrorist threat to us. This is the first case I've ever heard of, of accepting refugees who amongst them are part of the warring ethnicity. I mean, it, it, would, be like, it would be like taking refugees during the Second World War, but taking Germans. Instead uh, of Jews or other victims. Taking members of the Waffen SS. Well, and not screening for them. Exactly. I'm just going to end. I mean, there's lots of photo ops today. I mean, the Prime Minister's selfie is there handing out and to, to very carefully selected pictures. I heard that there were um, two dozen people on that first flight last night who were sequestered and quarantined by the RCMP. I don't know if that was for security reasons or health reasons. Do you know anything about that? No, nothing yet. And uh, this is not something that the government might be willing to share. But I, I guess looking back at Syria, I mean, it's a very complicated conflict, uh, and the Western countries made a muddle of it um, from the very start. I mean, there's three different layers to the conflict and all the different factions, but, and there's nobody wearing a white hat, and there's plenty of black hats to go around, but uh, Bashir al-Assad is, you know, he's a monster, but he's a hobgoblin compared to the ogre that's up against him. And most Syrian refugees were displaced inside Syria, including most Sunnis, ran to the government lines. In other words, the safe refugees the one, are the ones who had to run from ISIS, and they ran to the government lines. And that's where there are people like Druze, Alawites, the Christians, the people that we would not be that worried about. That's where the refugees are that we need here not the people who may be supporting the Muslim Brotherhood or the Salafist sects. You know, I did a line-by-line -line analysis of a poll taken a year ago by an Arab uh, university headquartered in Qatar that interviewed 300 Syrian refugees in Turkey, 
300 in Lebanon, 300 in Jordan. So it, it, it was a poll of 900 Syrian refugees. And only 11% of them said Islamic fundamentalism was the greatest threat. 41% said either United States or Israel was a greater threat. And depending on how you ask, 31 to 37% of them were against the war on ISIS. So 37% they did, said they didn't want the coalition to fight the Islamic State. 31% said they disagreed with the goal of degrading the Islamic State. That is a scientifically sound, professionally administered poll showing that about a third of these Syrian refugees are on the side of the bad guys, and we haven't rejected one. Uh, also, we look at the experience from Europe. I mean, it was being known six months ago that ISIS was starting to thin out its people in Iraq and Syria, and that they were feeding them into Europe uh, through the refugee movement, through the mass migration movement. That, been amply confirmed, especially since the Paris attacks. Uh, so here it's clear that they are a danger, and we haven't got any filters in. And I understand there are some Ar Armenians who arrived, so some Armenian Christians who arrived. Those, the likelihood of them being terrorists is, I would say, close to zero. I've never even heard of an Armenian Christian terrorist. They were about 30 years ago. Okay. but So there are some, and I think of, there are probably amongst them, some Muslim liberals, probably some Muslim Democrats. But there is no sorting going on. There is no ideological sorting, no cultural sorting. And I don't even believe that there's a true security sorting. I don't believe that once they fill out the forms, are you a terrorist? Nope. I don't believe that there's any human checking going on. You can't check 500 people a day. We don't have the RCMP or CSIS uh, resources, let alone the language skills. Uh, well, there is a lot of automation that might have to be done. We'd be checking the, the names against uh, the lists of other countries and against Interpol. But again, it's quite rudimentary. It's, it's the most basic point. And we're checking people who we've flown over, who have arrived here. Yeah. Well, that's what's so weird about these 23 who were in quarantine at Pearson Airport. Why were they brought here if they weren't, if they weren't fully vetted yet? John, it's good to talk to you. I find this deeply troubling. And, and there's two more problems, the opacity of the government, just refusing to give information, confusing their own people. We were told the flights would come from Jordan. This flight was from Beirut. They clearly don't know what they're doing. And the pure cheerleading by the media in Canada, including the front page of the Toronto Star, not with reporting questions, but welcome. I don't mind being welcoming of lambs, but not screening out the wolves and welcoming them too. I think the media is letting us all down. It's good to see you, John. We'll talk more about this I'm sure in the weeks and months ahead. And hopefully our worries will not come to fruition like they did in San Bernardino. But I wouldn't bet on it. Folks, stay with us. There's more on the Ashville Event Show. Ontario residents are being hosed on electricity prices. The latest Auditor General's report says we've been overcharged by $37 billion over the last several years. That works out to nearly $2,800 for every man, woman and child. Why? Mismanagement and bad policy choices from the Ontario Liberals. It's going to cost us billions more in coming years. Energy Minister Bob Shirelli won't take responsibility. He's lashing out. It's time for Bob to go. If you agree, go to firebob.ca. That's firebob.ca and make your voice heard. Hey, welcome back. Here's your viewer uh, feedback segment of the show. Mike says, hey, Ezra, there's three things I want to ask. Number one, when is the paywall going to start? I'll need some lead time to snail many of the money. Number two, is Faith Goldie's show behind the paywall too? Number three, You've been working pretty hard since Sun News folded. I always hated it when you missed an episode of The Source, but I think you deserve a vacation of some sort. You're way too young to have that many gray hairs, or gray airs, as Justin Trudeau would say. Hint, I always liked it when Jerry Agar filled in for you. Well, Mike, thanks for your super friendly letter. And we have been giving her full tilt here, not just me, but we got a whole team, you know, not just the on-air talent, but people running the cameras, editing the videos, putting things online. Our community manager, we got 175,000 people signed up by email now that everyone's got questions. So a whole team. We are going to gear down a bit over Christmas. We're obviously going to have stuff every day. But the Ezra Levant Show, that's what my show is called, we're going to take a week off over Christmas. Um, so we're going to gear down a bit and take a little bit of a break. But listen, uh, you know me, I can't stay away from the news. If something crazy happens, I'm going to have to record a rant about it. In terms of faith, our plan, as you may know, is that we're going to 
keep lots of free little video hits outside the paywall, the short stuff, the stuff that we've done literally 2,000 of since February. You know, we've done more than 2,200 videos since February. So we're going to keep lots of those little freebies outside the paywall. Behind the paywall, that's where we're going to put the premium stuff for members. Membership, we're contemplating eight bucks a month. That'll be these longer Ezra Levant shows on The Hunt with Faith Golding. We've got another other couple of shows in mind. So yes, the long stuff will be behind the paywall. That's just our business model for how we can pay the bills. Remember, unlike the CBC, we don't get a billion dollars a year. So anyways, thanks for, for being so supportive. We don't have a firm date for that yet. We wanted to iron out the wrinkles first, you know what I mean? We wanted to make sure the quality was there. We wanted to add Faith to the, to the lineup because she's so amazing. By the way, super response to her debut show last night. It was a huge hit, lots of clicks, a ton of emails. I couldn't be happier, so thanks for that. Okay, next letter. George writes, I can't believe the negligent response of ceases to reporting possible terrorist activity. Perhaps you could help me publicize the lax security measures we seem to have here in Canada. While walking in the East Don Ravine on December 10th, I have noticed and photographed a huge ladder under the bridge that the GO train crosses over many times a day. There were several people with flashlights in the dark little room just under the bridge. The next day, the ladder was gone. Now, if I were a terrorist bent on mayhem, what better opportunity I could find than blowing up the bridge when the train approaches? I have reported this suspicious activity to the Toronto branch of CSIS. The nice gentleman asked if I reported this to the local police, and then he said that if I see anything else, I should call back. The slogan, if you see something, say something, is only useful if there is someone listening. Hey, can we put that picture back up for a second? Look, I take your point, and let's look at that picture there. Yeah, I see the ladder to the bridge and if you saw people there that is something that would make a fellow scratch his head i'm not an expert in security maybe those were workers checking something i don't know frankly my own instincts tell me it was not a you know a, a terrorist or criminal act but let me tell you what i thought when i read your email and saw your photo here's what i thought we have been trained not to see something say something Remember that whole Ahmed, the Ahmed Muhammad, the clock bomb kid in Texas? That whole exercise was teaching people if you see something so outrageous, like someone with a suitcase bomb, if you dare report it, you'll be ridiculed by the media as racist. You'll be sued, which he's suing the whole school board now and the Texas authorities. And the Attorney General of the United States is investigating. So you are so right. And I think the reason why your letter resonated with me is because we have, we've got Islamophobia phobia. We're afraid of being called Islamophobes. So that fear is actually a higher fear than the fear of the terrorism itself. We saw that in San Bernardino. Remember that the neighbor of the terrorists saw at night a bunch of Middle Eastern men working in a garage. That's where they were making the pipe bombs. Thought it was highly unusual, but didn't dare report them because he didn't want to be called racist. Same thing with Nidal Hassan the Muslim uh, at Fort Hood, the U.S. in the U.S. military, who basically said, I'm a soldier of Allah. That was literally on his business card. And, and his commanding officer just said, you got to tamp that down. Like he didn't want to make a fuss. He went on to murder more than a dozen people there. My point is, I don't think in my layman's judgment that what you saw there was some terrorist preparation. But I also know that CSIS, the RCMP, the Toronto Police Service, and certainly our political and media class have got regular Canadians so afraid to report things that they're actually more afraid to report than of the underlying terrorism. And that has paved the way. And you know, you see it even in the non-vetting of these migrants from Syria. As I've mentioned so many times now, Brian Lilly heard from the technical briefing of Immigration Canada, not one single refugee has been rejected of all the applicants. Don't tell me that's possible. Don't tell me that's possible if you're having any standards. But you want to be the immigration officer who says no? You want to be the CSIS or RCMP officer who says no? I think we're in danger because we are being numbed to the most dangerous people out there. We're more afraid of being afraid. Zandra writes, next letter, Zandra says, I regularly receive your emails and appreciate the information that you send out. However, I wish you would stop the name calling in your mail outs. You will never win over others by calling them names. It is a poor form of speaking when in debate. It is not permissible or admirable even in the they did it first. 
please consider always attacking the issue rather than the persons. All right, well, let me address that in a few ways. I usually don't use meaningless insults like dumb dumb. I, I, it's true, yesterday I called Leonardo DiCaprio a dumbass. It is true. But other than occasional examples where it just, you really gotta use an insult like that, usually I use names that are labels with meaning. Like for example, I called Omar al-Jabra an extremist. I called him anti-Semitic. Uh, those, you could call those names, but they're not just personal insults. I mean, you may take them as insulting, and frankly, I hope you do, but they describe his characteristics. Omar al jabra I'm just using him as an example, because I think that's what you might be referring to. He is anti-Semitic. Uh, it's not just my view. The Federal Court of Appeal tested that when the, Can the Can Air Canadian Arab Federation whined about having its government grants cut off because it was anti-Semitic. The Federal Court of Appeal said that's a reasonable opinion to have based on their conduct. So is that name calling or is that an accurate description of the Canadian Arab Federation that back in the day was run by Omar al-Jabra? That's an example there. When I, when I call people, for example, I called the people who were trying to shut down Trinity Western University's law school program, I called them anti-Christian bigots. I called them the real bigots. Yeah, that's sort of a mean word, but what else would you use to describe law societies in BC, Ontario, Nova Scotia that say we're not going to allow Christians to become lawyers if they go through Trinity Western University because they've taken this Christian conduct pledge? I mean, what is that other than religious bigotry? So I, I understand what you're saying. You're saying don't make the personal attacks, but when you describe the character of some of these people, like Margaret McQuaig Boyd, I'm sorry, I, I believe that she's lying. And that, that's the reason it's news. That's not sort of a throwaway insult. That's not saying you're a dum-dum. That's saying I believe her, her crocodile tears were fake. And that's just my opinion. Anyways, I, I hope you, uh, you write back to me and tell me what you think, Sandra. That's it for today. Uh, that's it for the week. We've got more content all the time. We'll be back on Monday with the show. And hey, wasn't Faith amazing last night? I'm so glad she's part of our team. Uh, send me your feedback to Ezra at therebel.media. Tweet me at Ezra Levant, or join our Facebook page. You know, our Facebook is so lively. That's actually where we get most of our traffic. Did you know that? Anyways, that's it for me. Keep fighting for freedom. We'll see you on Monday.